Are you, are you still, um, are we going to give a, a couple minutes to let people in or are we ready I to think, go? I think we could just go. Um, I will let them in if they show up. Okay. Well, good morning and welcome. Um, my name is Joan Dennison and I'm the president and CEO of Covenant Place and the Mirrorwood Center. And I'm truly honored and excited to welcome you to the Mirrorwood Center Veterans Day celebration. And it's now just a pleasure to introduce a distinguished veteran and a resident of Covenant Place, Helen Kevrick. Hi, my name is Sergeant Helen Kevrick. I'm a Korean War veteran who's one of the first two women to go through drill instructor school with the men of Paris Island, South Carolina, and serve as a drill instructor. I am also the proud recipient of the Korean Service Medal and the Good Conduct Medal. On behalf of the Mirrorwood Center, I thank you all for joining our program to honor and celebrate the men and women of the United States Armed Forces. We invite you to sing along as we play our national anthem. Can you see? I think our sound is not working. Yeah. Well, everybody can sing anyway. Yeah. recognize and salute the veterans of the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, and the Coast Guard. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Benjamin Cooper, who is joining us from Italy, by the way, uh, where he's spending the semester teaching online because of the pandemic. <laughs> And we really want to say thank you to Dr. Cooper. There's a seven hour time difference between St. Louis and Italy, and we're especially appreciative of your participation in our program, Dr. Cooper. Uh, Dr. Benjamin Cooper is Associate Professor of English and Director of American Studies at Lindenwood University. And he's the author of Veterans of Veteran Americans, Literature and Citizenship from Revolution to Reconstruction. Uh, published by Massachusetts Press in 2018. Dr. Cooper is sharing a talk entitled Contesting Memories, Korea, Vietnam, and United States. Welcome, Dr. Cooper. There we are. Hey, thank you for having me. Let me see if I can't share my screen. So I've got some images I'd like you to look at. One second, here we go. I think you can probably see that. Is that the case? Can you see that? Very well. Well, thank you very much for having me. I, um, I am an English professor, as, as you just said, and I've been teaching all online, so I really haven't had a chance to speak live or even you know, in a virtual live format for some time. So I will try not to be long-winded, uh, keep my remarks relatively short. Um, but I, I put up here my information, um, my email address in particular, uh, if you would like to follow up, ask questions, comments, 
uh, please do email me. I apologize if I have to run after my remarks. I have to go help my kids uh, and my wife who needs to teach uh, herself later on in the evening. But I've talked, I, 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 I'm an academic, but I want to try to, um, to talk about veterans in a, in a non-academic way. And I'm not a veteran, but I wrote a book uh, about veterans. I'm the son of a veteran. My father served in Vietnam. And so I always feel very, um, uh, in, very not nervous, but I always am aware of my, my position when I'm speaking about veterans. And so what I want to think is kind of about the natures of our memorials, uh, specifically our national memorials, and try to contrast uh, what we're familiar with, the Vietnam and the, uh, the Vietnam Wall in particular, and the Korean Memorial in the National Mall, with some images that I have from Korea and Vietnam from a trip that I took to try to think about uh, some, some provocations that I'd just like to offer for you. So I don't have answers in this talk, but I just want to think with you briefly about the ways in which we remember our veterans and the wars in which uh, they served. And so my title is a little wonky, but I want to talk about Korea, uh, Vietnam, and the United States. So provocation one, I just want to say, just for you to think about, is that how it is that we remember our veterans and their wars, it's always imperfect, and it's always changing. And often those changes, the, the changes in the ways in which we remember veterans are at the service of our own culture's larger needs, be it to celebrate a war, to mourn the losses, or to move on and to forget. Uh, provocation two is that there is, of course, no one way that we could ever actually reduce the immense uh, variety of veteran experience down to any one thing. And yet we as a nation, like all nations, are always trying to do that in order to create really kind of coherent narratives. Um, and I would suggest, and I will get to this at the end of my, my remarks, that the real narratives that we should be focusing on are the narratives of veterans themselves, uh, that, they have, that they wrote, that they are speaking, um, and that the real honor on a day like this would be to listen to them rather than to listen to people like me, uh, who's once again not a veteran, talk about veterans, although I will do my best to give them some respect. So start with an image that I'm sure is very familiar, the wall, the, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial uh, from 1982, just as a way to kind of model for us. Can you hear me still okay? Yes. Okay, good. I just want to make sure you never know. Uh, to model for us kind of the, the, the usual ways in which we remember veterans. Uh, here are the names. The wall is, it contains, of course, the names of all 58,000 plus uh, American service men and women who lost their lives during the war, in part as an effort to remember the individual, if yet somehow impersonal stories of all of these veterans. Um, the urge really to remember by having every name listed is very different than the urge to remember veterans that we see in the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, uh, which is in Arlington National Cemetery just across the Potomac River from the Vietnam Memorial, which is a real kind of dense abstraction. If you've been here, you see the changing of the guard, the, 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 the army member who's always watching, keeping, keeping guard, of the unknown remains of soldiers from World War I, II, and the Korean and Vietnam War. That this one place is supposed to stand in for all veteran experience which is a very different way of remembering and thinking about veterans than here's a list of all of the people who lost their lives uh, in Vietnam. And so just, the, just my first brief example to try to prove my provocation that the ways in which we remember veterans, uh, of course, are different depending upon the context and our needs. This is a, an image, and this is not, not me, by the way, this is from the internet. I realize it looks kind of like me. Uh, but this is an image from the, from the Korean uh, memorial, which is very close yeah. on the National Mall, just across the, the fucking pool from the, the Vietnam Memorial, as a way to kind of think about um, a, a wall, uh, a similar kind of black wall to the Vietnam Wall, that is trying to kind of not give names, but to give faces, to create a more personal memory. The idea being here that we see these faces, and then of course visitors see our own faces in the wall itself being reflected back to us, as a way to try to kind of give us a more personal place, here's another image as well, that alongside the wall, and I apologize for the quality of this photo, we are also walking around the wall in this Korean memorial, and we are in the midst of a patrol with these larger than life figures, and they're larger than life, they're seven and a half, eight feet tall, um, and you know, men and women from all branches of the armed forces who are presumably in the rain or the snow of the Korean peninsula, and we are, we are in this memorial space asked to kind of put ourselves in that position of 1950s uh, Korea and to see their faces and to feel a kind of connection to recall what is really lost. Korea is often thought about or described as the quote unquote forgotten war. And this impulse to, to have faces as opposed to the names, which I'll get back to when we look at Vietnam more specifically, 
is very different from, and this is just to remind you, you know, where we are in this kind of very hallowed space of national memorials uh, in Washington, D.C. But this is a very different reaction than what we see in Korea itself. So these are some personal image, images from 2009, which uh, is more or less today. But if you go to the DMZ, if you drive north from, from Seoul, what you, what you, where you finally arrive is not at a, a solemn place uh, full, uh, full of statues or full of names, but you arrive at a parking lot with really, uh, it's a festival, it's like a state fair. That super Viking that you see there is, it's a boat ride that's, that goes back and forth, right? There are fun games, almost like a carnival-like atmosphere. And in fact, what you don't see are any images, any faces, any remembrance at all of the people who lost their lives or the people who served. Instead, you have images of celebration. Here, an image of children pushing the two halves of Korea, if not indeed the whole world, back together again, of reunification, all at the absence, once again, of thinking about veterans at all. Instead, we have kind of payons or we have kind of honors to not the past, not once again what we saw in the National Mall where that, that memorial really wants to, to bring us back to the 1950s, to put us in that time and that space. The Korean sense of the DMZ really is to look to the future and to reunification. So rather than mourn or think about veterans, we have, this is an image of, a, of the train station. It's right at the border between North and South Korea. And it's not operational, but it stands as a kind of memorial because inside you have bright lights, you have toilets, as you can see here, right? None of which is functional because you can't get there. But the sense of, as if you can read that inscription underneath the Korean, it says, not the last station from the south, but the first station toward the north. The war sits in Korean national memory. And, and I'm not a, a scholar specifically of Korean national memory, but, but at least in this sense of my personal visit to Korea, not as a place to remember or to feel solemn, but once again, to think about the future of reunification, to quickly kind of actually refuse to memorialize veterans uh, who served in that war. It's a different narrative, once again, uh, that gets at a larger kind of Korean need uh, that seeks family re reunification. Starkly different from, once again, uh, the wall. And so the wall, I realize, is um, a familiar space to all of us. It's one of the most popular uh, sites in all of Washington, D.C., one of the most visited uh, locations in, in D.C. And so I want to think a little bit with you about how the wall is also participating in a different kind of narrative, because when it was uh, designed in the late, uh, late 70s and early 80s, it was quite controversial. Uh, the design that Maya Lin uh, offered, this kind of wedge in the ground, was dismissed by politicians such as Ross Perot, who you may remember, as, uh, as being too solemn, being too sad. It looked like a grave, Perot said. And in fact, it is subterranean. This is below ground level. Um, you know, as you walk into the wall, the names of, of the dead uh, accrete, and you become overwhelmed until then you reach the, uh, the apex, and then you, you walk out the other side. But the, the agreement uh, ended up being why, why this design was, was acceptable was that it specifically avoided larger cultural narratives about Vietnam, of which, of course, they're very complicated. A war that was fiercely you know, fought over in the streets at various points in the 1960s. Um, and when the war was over, the question of what, it was, it, what was it good for, right? What was the cause? Uh, Reagan talked about kind of a, a noble defeat um, how do we necessarily celebrate the veterans while leaving out the larger national dialogues of what the war was actually about? And so the wall and it's, it's, again, its impulse to enumerate or to catalog, to quantify all of the veterans themselves uh, was in part an impulse to avoid larger entanglement with cultural commentary, with politics we might cause, we might talk about, to leave the politicians aside. What I would just suggest to you though, is that whenever we talk about veterans, whenever we talk about the wars in which veterans serve, it's, it's always impossible in some regard to avoid identity politics to a certain extent, and in particular overlying narratives that we begin to place onto narratives, uh, sorry, overlying narratives we place onto veterans themselves. What I'm showing you here is if you've been to the, to this, to the wall, you, you may remember this or you may not, this is what's called the Three Soldiers, which was added actually um, in 1984, two years after the wall was created, in part because people felt like there wasn't enough of a physical presence of veterans, that the, the names themselves were too abstract. And so 
what we have here are three soldiers who are certainly looking fatigued, exhausted, similar to how it is the Korean Memorial wants to play, put us in that time and place. And they are looking on the names uh, and from afar, right? And they are in, engaging and interacting with those, those lives that are implicitly baked into the actual wall. At the same time though, that we're, we, this, the addition of the three soldiers begins a kind of cultural and really a racial uh, narrative about Vietnam. Uh, if you can see, I don't know how good my quality is there, but the, the middle the middle soldier there, his face is coded Caucasian. The one on the left appears to be coded Latino. The one on the right coded African American. And so you begin to have um, this this additional narrative, this additional way of thinking about veterans as a as a in terms of a, through a racial lens that you didn't have with with just the wall itself. Um, this image is not too great, but just to locate you where you see that flagpole is where the three soldiers are, are, are standing, sitting guard. They're kind of at the, the gatekeepers to that top um, uh, pathway down into the actual wall itself. Another known part, or maybe not unknown, but at least a little more obscure part of the memorial that is added a couple of years after that, I'm going to show you that takes place in the image just off to the right of those trees that hidden from the wall, which is this dominant discourse or dominant kind of center or site of veteran Vietnam veteran memory, you have what was added in 1993, the Vietnam Women's mm -hmm. Memorial, uh, which was added because of activists. Uh, and that's not a bad word, but you know, women who yes. wanted their, their presence in, in Vietnam and their service to be, to be um, acknowledged. And I, I, I juxtapose what you see here on the left with uh, Michelangelo's Pieta from uh, the inside of, of the, of, St. Peter's uh, to see how it is, of course, that these compositions are echoed. There's a real desire uh, for, in this sculpture of the, of the Vietnam Women's Memorial, a real des desire to acknowledge the salvation of women who often served in a, in a nursing capacity. You see the, the, the woman looking up is looking up as if, uh, you know, looking for the chopper to come in and medevac them out. Uh, but you see women, of course, as, as a real saving grace within the memory of uh, a Vietnam veteran, um, the, the, the wall itself. But once again, it is also partially obscured and only added after uh, the fact and added ultimately, um, I'm trying to suggest as a, as a real kind of demonstration of how it is that our memory of veterans, in this case, Vietnam veterans in particular, is always changing and adapting over time. Now I'm gonna to try to bring you the time I have left, which is just a few minutes. I wanna bring you to Vietnam itself. Um, and what I'm locating you here is, is Khe San, uh, which was the, the site of a very famous siege during the Tet Offensive, uh, which my father uh, endured. He was there for it. And so what I'm gonna show you is in part um, images from our trip back to Khe San, which was the same trip as Korea, because I found it a very useful, very, just not only useful, but just enlightening uh, to see how it is that these different countries really reacted to the wars that we have uh, our own national spaces for. And so Quezon, which sits in the DMZ, um, is very much uh, a site that welcomes, I might, I might use a word like ideology, or at the very least welcomes kind of a clear national uh, narrative about the meaning of the war and how veterans specifically fought into it. So if, if the Vietnam wall wanted to resist that kind of um, outside political influence, Here's a scene from the a cemetery outside of Quezon that very much cultivates a narrative of martyrdom and of celebration. Here's a family, right? The narrative here is of a Vietnamese family who is in proud defiance of, of the American defeat. The child in particular is raising his arm and, and, and then the father has got the firearm in his arm and the proud defiant mother sits there and, on watch. Uh, inside the cemetery, you have images which of course we do not see in the wall of the actual war. Here are Americans who have been defeated and vanquished, actually killed right in the cemetery sculpture versus the victory images of the Vietnamese writing proudly uh, to vanquish the American invaders. And in fact, um, if you've been to Arlington, if you have a picture of Arlington National Cemetery uh, and with its rows upon rows of very organized and structured gravestones, the same kind of organization happens in the in, in Vietnam, Vietnam uh, cemeteries. Liet Si, uh, and my Vietnamese is not good, but Liet Si simply means martyr. And so there's this narrative of victory, but also of martyrdom. 
um, which is very much a political celebration of triumph, uh, which is quite different from how it is that America, with its vexed relationship with Vietnam, um, uh, sits and, and really contributed to the creation of those various monuments. Here's just a map that I want to locate you even more specifically to the obscurity of Khe San, and then I'm going to be done with my slides here pretty soon uh, and, and leave you with just you know, a, a final kind of thought here about the competition and the variety of different ways in which wars are remembered through their veterans. But Khe San is really in the middle of nowhere. It's a three hour drive uh, just to get there from the nearest city. And so what I have here is um, veteran memory itself, which has been obscured in large part, you know, just even in this talk, and certainly is obscured in the memorials that we go to visit. I've, I've blocked out the name. I don't know this person, but this is an entry to, um, to a book, like a, a, a guest book inside the Museum of Quezon from May 2009. And if you can read it, he says, you know, those who write in this book that didn't serve have needs to be careful on what you write. You must have walked the walk before you talk the talk. Um, and this was a fascinating moment of discovery for me. I was there with my father once again, who was who had served or who had endured uh, Quezon, because this same soldier came back three times during that summer in 2009 to fight with the various rhetorical um, territories that other people had been staking out for how to remember this site, often through stereotypes of, you know, what a tragedy, let us ne I'll never forget, the Vietnamese people are such wonderful, I mean, I mean, perhaps things that are true, but ways that were quite simple and that uh, avoided the real kind of experiences that soldiers themselves um, were, in this case, trying to express, or when I say soldier here, this is a, a, a captain of the US Marine Corps, so he's a Marine. Um, but this led to, and this is my final slide, and this is not an advertisement to go buy the book if you're interested at all. St. Louis libraries have copies of, of this book, but it leads to, it led to my interest in thinking about, well, what do veterans have to say themselves that so often we are, we are reluctant or, um, or we refuse to necessarily read that maybe the best thing that we should do on this a Veterans Day is to, rather than go to national spaces or to go to sites of remembrance that are very public, to have very private encounters and exchanges with veterans them, themselves, um, such as my book tries to do. And the final thought that I would just leave you with is that this image, uh, that the scribbles that you see there is a writing contest that was held after the Civil War for veterans who had lost their right arm in combat and uh, were trying to relearn how to write with their left hand so that they could become employable in uh, you know, clerical positions, you know, writing, for instance. Uh, but this, this contest, which is rather forgotten today, was very successful and got a lot of attention because veterans needed to speak and needed to be heard in ways that weren't necessarily externalized um, or that weren't necessarily told to them. And what this image is, is two, there was one soldier who had lost both arms during the war, but the need to speak and articulate was so great that he actually made a submission with a pen held between his lips. And so what you see there in the backdrop is, is just that effort. And so I would just uh, offer some provocations for once again, national memory, but just urge us all as we think about veterans and, and Veterans Day in particular, about how we can be more individual in talking to and listening to what veterans have to say. So with that, I will, uh, I will make my peace and wish you a good rest of the day. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. My pleasure. And I, I apologize was, for having to leave. That was, that was very interesting. Good. And now right. enjoying sing along to my country tis of thee as we play this brief musical video. It's not going. I'm trying. I'm gonna show you a picture.
are always so moving aren't they and what a wonderful yeah. um what a wonderful uh program from dr cooper and now it's my pleasure uh to introduce representative michael o'donnell who represents the southernmost part of the st louis county which is district 95 in the missouri house of representatives representative o'donnell is currently a lieutenant in the U.S. Navy Reserve, and he serves as an intelligence officer. He has previously deployed in both Iraq and Afghanistan. And Representative O'Donnell, we welcome you, and we thank you for your service to our country. Representative O'Donnell is running a couple of minutes late, and I'm terribly sorry. If we could just um, maybe have uh, Helen talk a little bit about some of her service or um, as oh, soon as the representative is available, we will. <laughs> I want you to talk about your service, just start. Uh, <laughs> you caught me there. I'm sorry, I, well, I, I think I it's three. uncomfortable. Okay. <laughs> no, she's okay. Okay, Go good, ahead. okay. <laughs> I, I served three years uh, in the reserves with not in the active duty and then three years reserves. Uh, it was it was one of the most uh, interesting things I've done in my life. And I was very always very proud to have been a Marine. Um, there's funny stories about some of the things that happened, but um, basically it was it was just something that I was very proud of doing and proud to be able to. What challenges um, did you encounter, Helen, uh, being a woman in service at that time? What challenges? What challenges? Challenges? Well, the, the real challenge was going through drill instructor school because this other young lady and myself were the first two women to ever go through a drill in school, in drill instructor school, and we were the first with all the men, so they really weren't ready for us, and we don't know if we were ready for them either. But it turned out to be an exciting um, experience, and it, it was when there were women DIs before me but they didn't go to school. They were on the job with men. So it was, um, I mean, it, Did you take flex? A, a funny story is that um, when I graduated boot camp, I got my first stripe and it was a PFC. And you're so proud of that. 
and you're going home on leave and you're all dressed up in your uniform and there's a woman sitting on the plane next to me and she's staring at me and I know she's really impressed with me. I thought, wow, this is great. And then, um, but she didn't say anything to me. So I'm kind of priming and, you know, pressing, you know, whatever. Anyway, she's at the plane lands. We're getting up to leave and she looks at me and she says, "My, because my uniform was green and, and white stripes at that time. And she looks at me and she says, are you a Girl Scout leader? Uh-oh. And that, <laughs> that really took some air out of me. So that was one of the funny stories. Oh, thank but, you. Um, I think um, Representative O'Donnell has joined us and I want to thank you, Helen, for sharing. And you that was great, thank you. Okay, great. So, okay, well, we will once again welcome uh, Missouri State Representative Michael O'Donnell. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks, I'm glad to be here. <clears throat> so, I'll, I'll go ahead and start and, and introduce myself. Um, so I'm State Representative Michael O'Donnell. Um, among other committees, I serve on the uh, Veterans Committee in the Missouri House of Representatives, uh, where I'm the Vice Chairman. And the Speaker just appointed me to that that role last year. So that was that was really that that committee is a lot of fun because there's not a lot of partisanship there. The, the building is filled with partisanship and political wrangling, but that committee seems to have a focus. And that focus is taking care of our veterans. So that's, uh, you know, in the, in the rest of my world, um, you know, I've, I've received uh, happy Veterans Day wishes from many people, but I'm not a veteran. Uh, I still serve in the United States military. I've deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, and I currently serve as an intelligence officer uh, with a central command unit at Jefferson Barracks. Um, I, I think. I think a, a lot of people look at, um, you know, I, I heard your story earlier. I think a lot of people look at, at the military and I, 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 it sounds like you were very young when, when, you, when you went through that experience. I was very old when I went through that, that initial experience um, through boot, boot camp and everything. Um, as part of my, my career, I've been in public finance for almost 30 years now. And uh, in September of 2001, I was in New York and my plans for September 11th, that Tuesday, that beautiful Tuesday in New York, were to be at the Trade Center to see a guy I had interacted and, and worked with and become close with uh, for about eight years. And his name was Carl Smith. And um, those planes hit the, that tower and I called Carl just, just to say, just because we didn't really have a sense of what was going on, just to say, hey, Carl, if you know, if we're supposed to get together. If your building gets evacuated, don't feel like you have to wait around downtown. Just go home. We'll get together some other time. But my calls, my attempts to call him um, were all met with, with strange busy signals. And uh, ultimately, those buildings came down, and Carl didn't make it home to his, his wife and his two kids. And I came home from that experience feeling like I should be doing something. But I was in my early 30s, and all I could think was, it's it's too late. I mean, you can't do anything, um, and, and yet that that feeling wouldn't go away. And so I started to to dig around, and discovered that it wasn't too late. That I could I could do something, and so um, I ended up enlisting through an advanced pay grade program at the age of 36. Went to boot camp at, at 37, and deployed to Iraq at age 40. And um, I have absolutely no regrets. The um, you know, it was definitely a, a strain on my family. My wife was not a huge fan of the whole thing, but she understood that that that, that feeling just wasn't going away. I'm watching two wars on television and feeling like I should be doing something. And so, um, you know, that I think you know, a lot of people. Let's see, let, maybe we'll use this as an example. So, some of you are probably probably mothers, and there's there's a bond there. There's there's something there that that I will never. Feel. I have, I'm very close with my children, um, but but a mother's bond is, is very special, 
And um, I, I, I think the same thing, and some of you that are, that are military veterans, especially those of you who have been to, to areas where there's combat, that relationship you had and have still with a lot of those people is very different than any other friendships or relationships you have with siblings or your children or your parents or whoever. Those relationships are, are very different. And so I, I think one of my favorite things about Veterans Day is, is there seems to be that reconnection that's going on between veterans. They're, you know, they're reaching out to, to each other to see how each other's doing. You know, we, it's so, so important in the military, we're always checking on our buddies and we're checking on the members of our team. Uh, in the Navy, we, we as officers, we, we, you know, one of my primary focuses is simply taking care of my sailors. And that's, that's to me, for veterans, I think that's what this day becomes for a lot of them is taking care of their, their brothers and their sisters that they serve with. Um, but that's, that's really what Veterans Day means to me. And, and I'm, I'm always so grateful to the, the people who have served before me that, that they've paved the way for me to, to be able to do the things that, uh, that I've been able to do in the, in the military. I consider myself very fortunate. Um, I, and I don't want to. I don't want to talk too long. I know you guys have a, a great program. Looks like planned for today. But I just, I really appreciate being invited. And I'm and I'm happy to answer any, any questions, whether it be on the, the state representative front or, or military front or, or whatever. But thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Dr. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you coming today. My pleasure. That was, that was very moving um, to think about the relationship that people have with people that they serve and how different that relationship is. And, you know, thank you for doing something about your feelings and stepping up after the 9 11 uh, crisis. I think many people. Um, wanted to do something and, and you did. So that's very inspiring. Thank you for Thank your you. service. Thank you, Nancy. And we want to just sort of conclude our program by again, thanking Representative O'Donnell and thank you, Sergeant Helen Kevrick and Dr. Cooper for a very interesting program. And really to everyone who is participating today and to perhaps the people you know and the loved ones you have who have committed themselves to the service of this country. Um, my own husband is also a military veteran and for everyone who loves someone who served, um, there's always those personal stories and the personal sacrifices as well. So we wanna conclude our program with a video of God Bless America. And have a good day. God bless America.
thank you everyone. And thank you, Carla Foyer, also for your help with this wonderful program and Stephen Cohn and Judy Oliver, our Muirwood Center staff. Have a good Veterans Day and stay well. Thank you, everyone.